district attorney's office. Um, I'm the only assistant district attorney um, in this subunit, and um, I share a paralegal with others, uh, <laughs> detectives. So it's like a unit of one and a half people. Um, but the idea is that we will investigate and prosecute economic crimes committed by employers against their employees. And the more common term for those economic crimes is wage theft. Um, and that can be pretty broad, uh, but the most common examples include failing to pay just the base rate that someone's owed, whether it's not giving someone their final check when they quit or when they're fired, or just uh, underpaying someone for the hours that they work. It could involve not paying them the appropriate amount of overtime if they've earned it. Um, it can involve illegal deductions from employees' paychecks. Um, other examples can include worker compensation fraud or unemployment compensation fraud. Um, this falsifying payroll records could be misclassifying employees as independent contractors. Um, so that the employers don't have to pay the taxes or benefits um, or the same uh, hourly rate for independent contractors that they are required to pay for employees. Um, so it takes on a variety of forms. It can be as simple as I mentioned as not giving someone their final paycheck or as complicated as labor trafficking schemes. Um, and we're tasked with investigating and prosecuting that within the city and county of Philadelphia. Um, so it's a lot to undertake and I'm just getting started. Um, so I, I haven't yet prosecuted any cases, but I do have a couple of investigations going um, and I can sort of tell you all a few details about some of those investigations so you can get a sense of the types of cases that I'm handling right now. And if anyone has questions or if I say anything um, that's not clear, um, I'm happy to, to give more detail or to clarify. Um, I come from a labor law background and we use a lot of acronyms um, that may not be familiar. So if I say something uh, that anyone's not sure about, I'd love to make it more clear for you all. But uh, just to give a couple of examples, my first case that we're investigating right now comes out of the construction industry. Um, and this involves an employer who sort of fell on hard times. And he, you know, he tried to do his best to keep the business going and to play, pay his employees. But in the meantime, he stopped paying their health insurance, stopped paying their retirement benefits. And these were union employees. So he was deducting union dues from the money that they earned from their paychecks and pocketing that money. He was deducting other, other fund um, contributions that the employees paid so that you know, their union has a political action fund. So each employee would contribute a certain amount from their paycheck. The employer was deducting that money and again, the money sort of disappeared, it never went to the union. So eventually the employer did make up some of the payments for the retirement funds and the health insurance, but all of the money that the employees had earned and that was deducted from their paychecks to go to union dues, to go to their political action fund, to go to other social funds um, was never recovered. So. I'm investigating that case, and it's likely that we will be prosecuting that employer for stealing that money from those employees. This is money that they earned as part of their hourly pay that he was supposed to deduct on their behalf and remit to their union for specific purposes. Um, and instead, the money was deducted and disappeared. <laughs> um, so that case is more of a straightforward theft case because um, it's money that the employees earned that was entrusted to the employer. It's, you know, it's like embezzlement. He, um, and in Pennsylvania, I believe the statute is uh, failure to make required disposition of funds received. But um, You just that, made me super happy. 
because we just talked about embezzlement. So I just love, I'm just very happy. Keep going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this case, um, we picked it as one of my first cases because there is a large paper trail. There are records of um, the amount of money that employees agreed to have deducted from their pay. There are payroll records showing that the deductions were made. There were reports that the employer submitted to the union showing that he acknowledged that he owed the money, but he just never paid it over. Um, so we thought this was a good first case because it's easier, easier to make out considering we have all of these records, all of this evidence. We still have to conduct an investigation, um, but um, it's more straightforward. Another case that I'm also looking into that's a little bit more complicated is in the restaurant industry. Um, and this case involved a small restaurant chain. They had three locations in Philadelphia. And um, there's some racial discrimination going on here, which is not criminal, uh, but it's wrong, where the front of the house staff, um, the servers, the hostesses, um, tended to be white. I think there's only one woman of color who worked front of the house staff. And everyone who worked in the kitchen, the dishwashers were all African-American, and the prep cooks and cleaners were all Latinx. And the restaurant owner, who also um, manages two of the locations, basically told those back-of-the-house workers, I don't have to pay you overtime. And when they would complain about it, he would make threats to some of the workers that he knew were undocumented saying, I know where you live, think about your families, and you know, I, I know what situation you're in and I know you need this job. So he was consistently underpaying these people. Um, some of them were averaging 60, 70 hours a week and they weren't getting paid any overtime for it. And when they complained, he would make these veiled threats. Um, that's a case where if we can prove it, obviously what he did was wrong. The problem is getting it to fit under our criminal laws in Pennsylvania to actually establish that he committed crime. Because generally, failure to pay overtime is a civil or administrative law violation. Um, there are ways to sort of make out the case as theft, um, but we have to um, we have to see if we can build a case to actually establish it as theft. I might have um, a stronger case in terms of ethnic intimidation and the threats that he made um, if we can prove some other elements. So that case is one that um, I feel strongly about and I would like to go forward with, but stuck in a situation where it's um, how do I actually that was a criminal violation of the law that we have in the book here in Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think will, it's been part of the toughest, um, one of the toughest challenges of my job so far. Like I said, I started in September and the first month or so, I just scoured the crimes code and the labor law to see okay, where is their overlap, which labor laws have a criminal element, um, and which criminal laws might apply in a workplace situation, um, and what elements do I need to make out to establish those cases? Um, because obviously, my work as a prosecutor is not like the majority of prosecutors who get their cases assigned to them after the police have arrested someone. Um, and they, you know, they go to court, arraign the preliminary hearing, go through those motions, um, whereas my cases, I actually have to go out and find them and then investigate, see if we can establish the criminal law violation, then we go out and arrest someone and go from there. Um, so that's a general sense of a couple of the types of cases I'm dealing with right now, um, initially, but I think that will expand um, to other types of case of wage theft once I get established. I know early on it will take a lot of educating not only other ADAs in my office, but the judges um, who we will go before because 
most legal professionals see these issues as civil or administrative and not criminal. Um, so I wanted to start with um, some cases that would be easier to establish um, and educate the judges around uh, so that going forward, I can try to get more creative. Um, and all that's to say, you know, I, I never went to law school thinking I want to lock people up <laughs> and put people in jail. But in these types of cases, it's largely employers who are just working with impunity to just take advantage of workers. Um, the majority of people impacted by wage theft are lower wage workers, people are, who are struggling to make ends meet. And when something like this happens to them, even though it may only be a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars taken, um, that really can have an impact on their lives. It may result in those employees who are into crime to make ends meet when really they were harmed because they tried to do what's right, they tried to work, and they weren't paid for it. Um, so I see it. It's complicated uh, for me personally in terms of being a part of the criminal legal system, um, but I think it is important to show employers that they should not be able to profit off of mistreating workers in this way. So I hope that wasn't too long of a, of a response to that first question. No, it wasn't. And it, in fact, you touched on, you know, some other things uh, that I was thinking about asking you as well. Um, and I feel like there's so much, you know, so many things came up in your comment that are connected to conversations that we've been having all semester. Questions about the appropriate scope of the criminal law versus when things should be civil. Questions, personal questions, like the one that you've been wrestling with about what, <coughs> what, what, what role that you want to play uh, in the system. Um, so um, I'm going to ask one or two more questions, but I also want to say if anybody has a question or they want to jump in or you want to follow up, just like, just raise your hand just so that I can see you and we'll make, make sure you get in the queue. You don't have to, um, to wait or anything. Um, but you mentioned that the cases, your, your job is different in that cases don't just arrive on your doorstep the way they do for many of your colleagues. Could you say more about how you get alerted? Like, how do you, how do you get cases? How do you, how do you learn enough to know, okay, this is something that I might want to pursue? Yeah, um, so it's funny, my title is Labor Liaison, and I was like, okay, liaison, that makes sense, um, because a lot of my work initially was doing outreach to stakeholders um, so that they know that I'm here and they can start referring cases to me. So that included meeting with um, legal services attorneys. In Philadelphia, uh, we have community legal services here. Um, we have other nonprofit legal aid organizations that um, do employment law um, and serve low wage populations. So I met with them. I met with people from the law school clinic at Temple and Penn that uh, deal with low wage worker employment issues. Um, I've done outreach to community organizations and worker centers in Philadelphia. I've reached out to unions and met with uh, union staff and leaders in case they see issues popping up. I'm doing outreach to other government agencies on the civil side. So in Philadelphia, we have the Mayor's Office of Labor, which has an office of benefit and wage compliance. And they enforce the city's civil ordinances around Wage theft. Um, we have a city law that requires um, posting of schedules in advance and consistent schedules for retail workers. Um, we have a law that requires paid sick days to employees. So that office enforces those laws. Um, and that's all civil. But if they see egregious cases, they've been calling me to say, hey, this, 
this is what's going on, is this something that could possibly be prosecuted criminally? So one of the examples I gave you from the restaurant case, I actually got that case through that mayor's office of wage and benefits compliance. And they actually got the case through community legal services because two of those workers went to CLS to complain about um, how they were being underpaid. CLS investigated. Um, they tried to go after the employer um, in a private civil suit. Um, and then they thought, hey, why don't we give this to the mayor's office? Maybe they'll have better luck to get these people paid faster. The mayor's office started investigating and they realized that the employer just pretended to cooperate with the investigation and said, you know, hey, we'll get our accountants to look into this and then just stopped returning phone calls. So then they reached out to me to see if there was a way that we can um, go after them criminally. And that restaurant employer had already been cited by the Federal Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division for not paying overtime. And they were investigated and they settled that claim and had to pay um, back overtime to employees. So this wasn't the first time they were doing it. They knew they were wrong, um, but they just weren't afraid of the civil penalties, so they kept doing it. Um, so, you know, I get case referrals from different stakeholders. Um, like I said, I've met with the Mayor's Office of Labor. I've also met with the Federal Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division um, office in Philadelphia. I've met with the state Attorney General's office here in Pennsylvania um, because they have three attorneys who look at labor issues. Um, so, a lot of my job is doing that outreach um, just to get case referrals and also to learn from people who have been doing this work um, longer than I have, uh, but from the civil enforcement side. Um, waste theft is like a, it's a huge problem. It's hard to quantify because it's so underreported, but it's estimated that 50 to $60 billion a year um, is lost to waste theft mostly from low wage workers. Um, it can be in any, indus any industry, but it's largely concentrated in certain industries like construction, restaurants, home health care, um, temporary hiring firms, um, and other uh, agricultural work, domestic work. So it's happening, it's widespread, it's in every state. Um, every city, but it's hard to actually find the cases because some workers are afraid to come forward. They may be afraid of retaliation. Um, other workers may not be afraid, but they feel like, what is the point of coming forward? Maybe it means taking a day off of work to go meet with a legal aid attorney to discuss this issue, and then having to go to the other meetings and go to court appearances for the off chance that maybe they'll get a civil judgment that'll never be enforced. And they still may never see their money or go to a government agency that may investigate and may settle the case and maybe they'll get a portion of the wages that they were owed. Um, so some of it is fear and some of it is sort of a defeatist mindset that the system doesn't really work. And that's not to say that these legal aid attorneys aren't working hard and doing the best that they can. It's not to say that the government agencies aren't investigating um, and trying to enforce the laws, but it's so widespread. Um, and the system just works in a way that for a lot of employers, it's cheaper and easier to just run the risk of stealing the money and possibly getting caught. Um, than of doing business in a legal way. Uh, there's a question um, from one of, uh, of our students, uh, Veronica. Yeah, um, and I apologize if you haven't like necessarily thought this far ahead because you're in the investigation stage and I'm like zooming all the way forward to like plea bargaining. Um, but my question is you were talking about like the unenforceable um, like civil actions that people get and like how sort of like the money from the workers is like being sort of, I guess like never paid. Um, and I'm wondering if if you're thinking that like 
employers would pay some sort of restitution um, with that, with like a plea bargain or like sort of a conviction or something like that? Or like in the end, is it just a criminal conviction and, and sort of on behalf of the state with, with irrespective of like the money that's being lost to the workers? No, we will ask for restitution in all of our cases um, because the bottom line is the workers are the victims here. We want to get them justice. Um, and justice doesn't necessarily mean putting someone in jail. Um, ideally, it means paying them back what they were owed with interest. Um, but even that is not true justice because if someone was underpaid two years ago and they're finally getting the money now, who knows what's happened in the intervening two years, who knows how they fell behind and things, what they've had to sacrifice. Um, but no, it's not just um, a push to um, arrest and potentially incarcerate people. Uh, we will be asking for restitution. And realistically, I believe that most, if not all of my cases will be clean. Like, they'll end in bargain and we will probably not actually push for real jail time. Um, but even the threat of arrest, especially if there is um, media coverage of employers getting arrested for this, it might signal to employers that, hey, even if I'm not afraid of a potential civil penalty, um, that I can explain away to my neighbors and say, oh, don't worry, my account messed up on something, not a big deal. Me getting arrested might be something that I don't want to happen and I don't want out there. Um, so maybe it's not worth it for me to to take this risk you know, for my employees in these things. Um, so, yes, it's something that I'm certain, certainly thinking about the restitution for the victim. Um, and also, um, we'll have to deal with it case by case, but figuring out um, how much jail time we actually put for, um, if at all, and what those uh, two bargains look like. How fun is it? <laughs> Did somebody call in to confess? <laughs> uh, there, I have another question from Claire. I don't know if you can see her on the screen or not, but. On the screen. Okay. <laughs> um, you mentioned that many of the victims of wage theft are undocumented, um, and undocumented folks, as you know, can get visas for helping with law enforcement. Does your office plan to do sort of U visa outreach or U visa work? Your undocumented victims? Yeah, so um, if we have cases, if I have cases that qualify for either a T visa for trafficking or a U visa, um, we will definitely um, consult with our immigration counsel in house. We have a lawyer on staff here at the district attorney's office whose sole focus is immigration. So I would definitely consult with them in those cases uh, and when we could apply for visas or help. Um, secure them for people, we would try that. Um, unfortunately, the cases that qualify for U visas, um, mm -hmm. you know, certain types of crimes, yeah. uh, certain violent crimes, a basic wage theft, um, especially if it's under like the Pennsylvania Wage Payment and Collection Law, which just has um, a summary of sense <laughs> for wage theft that wouldn't qualify for you these things if someone's cooperating with our investigation. Um, so you know, in the cases where if someone might qualify where for the program, we would definitely um, look into that on their behalf. Um, and in our office, you know, a crime victim is a crime victim regardless of their immigration status. Um, we're not here to out people. Um, we want to support victims and try to seek justice. So we will do what we can, um, and I would work with immigration counsel in those places. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know if you can see me, but at least you can hear me. So, um, just to follow up on that, I was thinking that one of the advantages of civil actions for these types of cases is that someone who's undocumented might have more control over the case, like they could tell their attorney, 
actually, I don't really want to move forward, or I would rather you just send a demand letter. I don't really want to pursue this in court. So how, uh, working um, in the prosecutor's office, how are you dealing with that kind of issue? Mm -hmm. It hasn't arisen yet, but one thing I make clear um, when someone tries to refer a case to me is that we can't go forward unless the victim and witnesses are willing to cooperate and come forward. Um, because, I mean, you all are students in the criminal law case. You know that criminal defendants have certain constitutional rights. Um, and I can't put up a case with an anonymous victim who won't actually um, attest to the amount of wages that were stolen and won't participate in investigations that just would never meet the criminal legal standard. Um, even if I have cases that go before an investigative grand jury where things, um, where there is uh, a better chance of secrecy during that process, once we get to the point of arrest, we still need witnesses who are willing to testify in open court. Um, so if someone does get scared and decide that they no longer want to participate, that may mean that I'm just not able to continue to pursue the case um, if I don't have the witnesses who are willing to testify. Um, but it's something that um, I personally am sensitive to. Um, and I can understand the fear. And even though our office does not cooperate, with ICE, um, we do know that there's an agent in the courthouse waiting for people. Um, so, you know, we're sensitive to that, um, but we make it clear early on that in order to facilitate the victims, um, really need to be willing to cooperate. And just as a quick follow up, so what if there was um, a group of employees where some are undocumented and some are not, and the folks who have status or have papers are interested in moving forward, but the undocumented employees are not? Like, I know this is a crazy hypothetical because you've just started, but what, um, what might you, how might you think about that situation? It actually is something that has been raised a few times. Um, and one of the contexts where it might come up, um, actually, is in the union context, where in certain cases, um, there may be a union who wants to target an employer that hires a large undocumented, undocumented workforce to put them out of business, where the workers themselves may not be willing to come forward, but maybe the union has one or two people that they've gotten hired. Um, Sort of behind the scenes, and those people want to cooperate and build a case to shut the employer down where the other workers don't. Um, we have to look at those on a case by case basis, but if, if most of the victims don't want to participate, um, and depending on the scope of the crime and how big of a case it is, so we may just say, you know, we're staying out of this, and you know, there are civil remedies available. Um, <laughs> If it's a more serious crime um, with a lot of workers, a lot of money, we may decide to pursue it anyway. Um, and there are forms that victims fill out in, in property or death cases saying, you know, attesting that this is, this is their property, this is how much it's taken, this is the value. Um, so there may be victims who are willing to just fill out that form but they're not willing to testify in court and cooperate in other ways, we could still try to seek restitution for them um, without exposing them to the same risk of, you know, coming forward in open court. So it just, it depends on the situation, um, but it's something that we're definitely aware of um, and we'll work around it to benefit everyone and not, um, not try to put people in harm on the way if they really are afraid. But um, but yeah, it would, it would have to be a case by case situation, but we would need at least some of the victims to cooperate um, at the bare minimum uh, filling out um, that form assessing to the fact that they were indeed victims. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go over here. A couple questions here, um, Isa and uh, Asim, and then uh, Nicholas. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, you mentioned earlier some of the breadth uh, in terms of wage theft around the country. I'm wondering, as you're, you're getting started, and, and really, um, how, how are you defining success? Um, is success based off of investigations, completed investigations based, based off of cases that come forward, or is it in terms of, you know, people that may decide to contract, um, go to their own purposes of getting more power in terms of their negotiations with their employer? Is it white papers where people know about their rights? How are you sort of coming up with your metrics of what success looks like in terms of getting justice? Well, honestly, a lot of this is me, like, making it up as I go along. <laughs> um, but long term, I think so would be really signaling to employers that this behavior will no longer be acceptable um, and sort of reducing the amount of wage theft that's happening. Um, but that's a very long-term idealistic goal. Um, but in the immediate, yeah, I think not just completed investigations, but completed investigations that result from victims to victims um, is one measure of success. And education is a big part of that. Um, like I said, I've done a lot of outreach. I've met with stakeholders. I haven't yet gotten to the stage where I'm doing um, outreach to the general public. I haven't put together education materials that um, just go to the public just yet because I wanted to get a few cases under my belt um, and really figure out what these prosecutions look like before we sort of open the floodgates um, and the way it's working now on having cases that are sort of like um, they're vetted before they get to me, um, whether it's through a community organization or um, a government enforcement agency or nonprofit lawyers. Um, but I do think informing the general public more about their rights is important. Um, but the reality is that most of these examples of wage theft will never be um, will never be addressed, whether civilly or criminally. And the ones that are um, very few of them will, will be criminal and come to me. Um, but I hope that I can have an impact um, in letting employers know that it's not worth it. You might get arrested. Um, so I guess. Years down the line, we can sort of try to measure if, if I've been successful here. Um, related to Issa's question about success, um, obviously your background is in the labor movement and working for a union, uh, and one part of your role is to be a labor liaison. Uh, so I'd be curious to know your thoughts on how you think having a robust office like yours in the TA's office um, will impact workers um, and the labor movement, how, uh, how you think that their bargaining position or their ability to have leverage over employers might change over time as your office becomes uh, more successful. Yeah, so my background is in labor. I was actually a union organizer before I went to law school. And I think um, in terms of the impact on workers um, and building worker power, um, my work here in the DA's office could have more of an impact in the organizing context um, because that's dealing with workers who are not yet members of unions. Union members are less likely to be victims of wage theft just because their union has access to the employer's uh, payroll records. Um, and there's already mechanisms in place to deal with issues as they pop up. Um, where unrepresented workers um, are more likely to be victims and are less likely to want to come forward because they're afraid of retaliation. Um, so, I think my work can help empower workers in that sense where um, they know there's an, uh, another avenue to turn to where they might get some support um, in addition to the civil civil avenues available to them. Um, but you know, I, I would love to help build worker power um, here. I'm from Philadelphia, where I'm raised. Um, 
I would love to see an impact from that for the city. Uh, but I think it will take a lot and um, a lot of stakeholders need to work together and we need to make sure that workers are a part of that and that it's really a, a grassroots effort. And I look forward to trying to work with others and help build that. And my position came about because some people in the labor movement and others went to Larry Krasner and said, hey, we want you to create this position. We think it's important. And he's open. Um, and I just search and I was lucky enough to get hired. Uh, so it's it's definitely important and something that I think about, but I, I don't know how it'll actually play out. Um, yeah, I, so uh, I'd like to ask about, um, I, you know, when D.A. Krasner uh, came to office, he, uh, his office issued a memo about, um, you know, like essentially guidelines for ADAs or directives for ADAs on, you know, how to prosecute and, you know, what, how to make uh, plea, bar, uh, plea offers, um, which included, you know, making plea offers below the bottom end of the uh, sentencing guidelines and also thinking about you know, in sentencing, thinking about you know, the forty-two thousand per person uh, dollar, sorry, um, per incarcerated person costs for the state, um, and I just wonder how that you know, apply or fit with the wage theft cases because it seems that deterrence seems to be quite important here, and this is not something that's been dealt with historically, um, and it's so widespread that how how would that play in here? Um, whether or not, obviously it could be a case by case situation, but generally would this still fall into the purviews of that memo or would it be like an exception? Because it says in most crimes, would this be in that most part or not the most part? So um, it is case by case and there are multiple memos um, in the office about um, you know, changes to the way this office prosecutes cases. Um, and that general mindset will apply to my cases. Um, I will say that a lot of the actual crimes that I'm able to prosecute um, already come with lighter sentences. So I mentioned the Pennsylvania Wage Payment Collection Law, which is the basic law that establishes that employees have to be paid the wages that they're owed. That has a criminal aspect to it, and it is a summary offense, which can result in up to 90 days in jail per offense um, and a $500 fine. So in that case, when if that is the, the main criminal law that, we're, that we can establish in the case, we bargain there. It'll, it'll be very, um, it'll be a light off when you know that's the maximum sentence that you're dealing with. Um, in a death case, like I mentioned, um, in the construction industry, um, in that case, the employers sold or embezzled over $100,000 from those employees over the course of the year. So that is felony theft territory uh, with higher potential sentences. Uh, but when we get to that stage, um, we will be giving realistic offers because the goal of this office is it to put more people in prison for the sake of putting people in prison. Um, we're looking at criminal justice more holistically. Um, and in this case, you know, we're not dealing with violent crimes here unless we get into some trafficking cases um, or cases involving other threats. Um, so it'll be case by case, but. Um, Yes, that general mentality will apply um, when looking at these I was wondering, are you going to be hiring law students next summer? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't apply to this class because they're all graduating, but if somebody, or almost all of them, but if some of them, uh, <laughs> they're almost all third years. All the third years are graduating. There's a few second years in the class. Um, and, but I was wondering if students are interested in this kind of work uh, and are is working with you in your office 
a a possibility in 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 general uh, because I know I bet there'd be a, a number of students here who would be interested in applying if it if it was a possibility. Um, that is like the first question I've gotten so far that's completely stumps me because I have not gotten that far. Um, whether we could have law students working um, on this work. I, I think it makes sense, and especially considering I am a unit of, you know, I'm the only attorney here <laughs> doing this work. <laughs> love the help. So uh, I'll, I'll think about that and talk to my supervisors. <laughs> uh, See, I'm just imagining you running this, because I, I think the pitch you're making is is very compelling uh, that a number of students will find it compelling and so i'm imagining you running like a mini summer office where over the over the three months those uh those documents that you want to write those know, those know your rights uh all, a lot of the work that you want to do right now that you can't get done because you're by yourself um i'm imagining you like having an empire, a team <laughs> of, of, of eager and aggressive law students who were like, oh, I didn't even know this was like a thing that a DA's office did. Um, and, uh, you know, helping you to produce all of that. So I'm dreaming on your behalf. <laughs> I appreciate that. And it's, a, it's a beautiful vision. Um, and that is now I, I have to you planted a seed. I will, uh, <laughs> I will see what I can do. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, oh yeah, sorry. We have, um, uh, I think you have uh, one more question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, just mention it. You mentioned earlier the idea of kind of creating the law for some of these cases after you've kind of put in some of the standard theft, wage theft cases. I just wanted to know if you've thought about or how you envision that kind of creative legal theory process working and where you see yourself drawing ideas from. Yeah, um, so we have certain law from the books here. Like, I keep going back to the way payment collection law. Um, even though it has a criminal component, it has never, in terms of all the legal research I've done, I don't think it's ever been enforced by a county district attorney in Pennsylvania. The Department of Labor and Industry in the state has it in maybe five cases over the, the years it's been on the books for 40 years um and those have, haven't yet resulted in the illegal precedent because it's a summary event so generally that's disposed of in our lower level criminal courts and they're not appealed and you never hear from you again so the higher level courts don't make that precedent so it's been um hard for me to even figure out what legal standards would apply in these cases um, in the criminal context, but I can look at the civil enforcement because that same law also has been enforced um, civilly and there's a lot more case law there. So I'm looking at that to figure out, okay, well, what's the standard when it's applied civilly? Um, how does that change? in the criminal law given the uh, the constitutional protections for criminal defendants um, and then other laws like for theft um, that's more established i i haven't been a prosecutor before i mean i became a prosecutor in september but i work in an office with 300 attorneys many of whom are career prosecutors they can help me prosecute a theft case. they may not be able to help me prosecute a wage payment um, so, I have been trying to look at laws in other states um, and if there are analogous laws in other states and how they've been applied. I've been reaching out to people from attorney general offices in other states because they, they mostly have been the ones enforcing um, those laws. There's some county prosecutors who have done um, some of this work. The Manhattan DA's office is a good example. Um, but yeah, looking at the civil enforcement for a lot of the labor laws and figuring out how to apply it uh, in a criminal context uh, is something that uh, I've been figuring out. Um, but a lot of this will turn on the strength of our investigation and building a case so strong that it 
it's clear that this person did what they're accused of. They did it knowingly, intentionally, um, and this is the crime that I think fits. Trying to build that strong of a case of that by the time we get before a judge, even if they're like, hey, there's no precedent, <laughs> there's no legal precedent here, um, it'll be hard for them to, to look at it and say, hey, I don't think you made out a crime. Um, that's if we actually get to that stage and all these cases don't end in clearing. Uh, but yeah, it's something I've been thinking about. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how it works out. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us and thank you for your work. Please stay in touch. I have a number of colleagues who um, specialize in uh, workers' rights and immigrant rights and we have a connected faculty that's also interested in um, criminal law and criminal justice issues. So um, I hope that we're, uh, we can stay connected. Uh, in the months and years to come, and uh, I'm rooting for you to to have great success. Thank you very much. Great questions you really got me thinking about the work. And if I'm able to hire law students next summer, uh, <laughs> maybe some of you will be here. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> 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 it's enough to <laughs>